set the standards. Scoring big hundreds and uh, hitting the ball out of the ground. I wanted to bowl and fielding and loved it, all, all aspects of the game. You realise that there was a natural talent there. Something that you're born with. Cricket's always been there, it's always been part of me. And I've had a great time. Ian Both is the most influential player that we've ever had. Ask him. Ian Botham's been the best advertisement for English cricket really since the Second World War. He just wanted to do everything 110%. He could swing the ball both ways. He could hit the ball as hard as anybody you've ever seen. It was like playing with 12 players on your side. There was a mission in life for Ian Botham. It was Aussie Bash. We certainly brought the best out in him. There's no doubt about that. Ian Botham just had that insane ability to just take wickets. He's just one of those generational people, one in a 50 years sort of thing. Has there been anybody like him? He was going to get everybody out, and he was going to score all the runs himself. End of. I always remember the curious officer said, well, what are you going to do then, Ian, when you leave school? I said, well, I'm going to play sport. Oh, yeah, of course you are. Yeah, now, what are you really going to do? And I had to point out that that's what I'm doing. I'm going to play sport. And uh, at 15, going on 16, I had to make a choice between football or cricket and I sat down with my dad and I said okay dad what do you think I'm the better at and he said cricket and uh, that was it I listened to him thank goodness in 1974 aged 18 Ian Terence Botham made his first team debut for Somerset in those early days in Taunton home was a two-bedroom flat next door to the county ground Botham shared the accommodation with two of his new Somerset teammates Dennis Breakwell and a 22-year-old batsman who had only recently arrived from Antigua in the West Indies. Living with Ian and Dennis at the time, um, it was a rude awakening, uh, I guess. Uh, I would have felt the same, the same to them. But at the end of the day, um, it, it, we had a wonderful camaraderie. That was great in there because um, when Viv came in, he moved into a, a little room with me. It was only a poky little flat, a little room. We had three rooms and, and Ian was in the... Um, in the room along the hall. And we had other flatmates, but they were mice. Ian and Viv were the two uh, crackerjacks, you know. They just sort of improved almost every match, and uh, both of them became great players. Both was always going to be both. An outward going character with strong physically, intimidating presence. He was obviously, from a very early age, going to be a uh, fine cricketer. He played in this match where he got hit in the mouth by Andy Roberts. Then you knew there was something special there because he just gritted his teeth and got down and won us the game. As his play developed, he, he, you know, he came on a bundle and, and it wasn't very long before you know, he was sort of promising to be played for England. I actually thought I was knocking on the door for about 12 months. Uh, before I got uh, the door got opened. But uh, when it came, you know, we had to wait for the news coming out at midday on the Sunday to find out what the England team was for the next test. And that's how you found out. Oh, my name's on the radio, I'm playing. On the 28th of July, 1977, Botham made his test debut against Australia. The most nerve-wracking thing is when you actually walk down the steps for the first time. And once you hit the turf, you're fine. I was pleased to get the ball in my hand. 
Um, should have had a third slip, but uh, that's, that's by the by. And, uh, and then Greg Chappell in my second spell came back and the first ball, a bit of a loosener and he dragged it onto the stump. Yeah, he was a bit unlucky, but I've got a few out of that loosener. I think it's, uh, the eyes light up and they think, oh, here we go. Nick it or drag it on or top edge it. And we knew he was a golden boy from the moment he got Greg Chappell to drag the ball into his stumps. England hadn't really been used to having a quality all-rounder who could get into the side either as a batsman or a bowler on his own merit. So to have those uh, qualities in one man was absolutely exceptional. Four more Australians followed their captain back to the dressing room, thanks to the bowling of both of them. His first five-wicket haul in Test cricket helped England to victory. His second in the following Test helped them reclaim the Ashes. He made his mark. I mean, he had the attitude that I didn't think he was the greatest bowler. I thought he was a fantastic batsman. He, he varied so much with, with the ball in his hand that you felt that you had to slog him out of the park. And he got you out. For an Englishman to make your debut against the old enemy um, and win the game is something you don't forget. You just don't forget it. It was a nice way to start. Taking those two fifers gives you a little bit of a, a cushion, uh, so you feel a bit more relaxed. You think, I'm in the side now. I'm going to be playing the next few games for sure. He wanted to go a long way in the game. He wanted to be as good as he possibly could. That would be the biggest thing, the drive that, that took him there, was his will to really, really win. Get 100 in New Zealand, and you, you want that tick in that box, 100 scored. It's a great moment, terrific moment. Um, thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, I was delighted. It, was, it went very, very well according to plan, and we were in a little bit of trouble, got the runs that we needed, and we went on to win that game at uh, Christchurch. Botham's star continued to rise. After just 21 tests, he had become the fastest player to take 100 wickets and score 1,000 runs. The end of the 70s also saw the emergence of Somerset as a force in domestic cricket. We hadn't won anything in, I don't know, 104 years or whatever it was when we were down there. And then to suddenly be in a team with people like Joel Garner, Viv Richards, Helen Mosley, uh, Peter Denning, Brian Rose, um, it, it was an exceptional side. So uh, we had a lot of talent down there and then we, we won a lot of competitions. We were playing because we enjoyed the cricket so much. We, we were focusing on winning and, and you know, the whole team doing well as opposed to individuals getting glory. At the same time, if you perform well, your performance was also a part of the contributing factor to whatever happened. The manner of our cricket was so intense and it was international because by that time five or six of our team were playing international cricket. Less than a year after helping Somerset win the John Player League and the Gillette Cup in 1979, both them came up against county colleagues Viv Richards and Joel Garner for back-to-back -back test series against the West Indies. Despite having never captained his county, both them succeeded Mike Brearley in skippering England. He was, I suppose, still pretty young and inexperienced in those days. But, I mean, I, I, you can't help the selectors, I think, for thinking this is the man to take England forward. I mean, he's by far the biggest character. I turned to him and I told him you, should have, you shouldn't have accepted it. What it did is it took away quite a bit of his skills and what he could offer to this team. It's always easy with hindsight, maybe close he was right. Maybe it did come a little early in my career. But when you're 24 and someone says, do you want to captain your country? Uh, it's a big decision to say no. Skippering against the West Indies uh, is a very, very tough assignment. And he had to do it at home in 1980 and away in early 1981. People would say Bradman's Invincibles in 1948 was one of the best cricket teams ever, but I think the West Indies side of the early 80s was uh, beyond compare. It was hard work, and particularly in the Caribbean, it was very hard for him because we were always second best, and although we lost, I think, the series 2-0, we, we, we never really competed. We beat them in a couple of one days, but uh, we couldn't do it in the test arena. And then the captaincy was being given to me one game at a time, which was ludicrous. The situation wasn't any good for me, it wasn't any good for the team. It put stress on my family. And uh, the selectors and their infinite wisdom thought that was the way to go. When Australia touched down for the Ashes series of 1981, 
Ian Botham's England hadn't won a test in 10 attempts. And it wasn't just the English cricket team that was hoping for a change in fortune. The country as a whole was a pretty depressed nation. There were riots going on around the country. Um, Mrs Thatcher was two years into her tenure as Prime Minister and probably at her most unpopular. Um, so tensions were high. People didn't like the way the government was going about things. The country needed something good. We had the race riots going on, there was all that trouble, there was the miners' strike, and we needed something to cheer us up. However, the Australians led by Kim Hughes had other ideas. We won the first test match at Trent Bridge. Um, just, you, you know, it was a pretty close game. We only just got there, and pressure was building on both. And then came uh, the rain interrupted match at Lord's, and uh, Ian's uh, uh, pair and the silent members. It was a pretty low moment in Ian's career. Yeah. I know he was very hurt when he walked off at Lord's, that silence. And he and the MCC had a bit of a dodgy relationship at the time anyway. So I think that probably suggested to him that there was a, a really big problem if he hadn't known that up to then. And that's when I resigned, after the Lord's game. It just didn't happen, so a bit. You, know, you move on, I thought maybe I'd get another go later on in life, but to be quite frank, I didn't really want it. I was glad when, when he, he ceased to be captain, you know, and, and of course straight away he started going back to his old ways of, of thinking about his own game. It was great for Ian to get out of that. He's not going to go into press conferences and what about this, what about that. Do you think? No. Now, give him the bat, give him the ball, go and do it. I was asked who I would pick, and I said, well, look, for me, Mike Brilley's the man, and uh, he came in, and I always remember Brilliers coming up to me at Headingley, and he said to me uh, in the next, the day before, I totally understand it, he said, if you don't want to play this game and have this one off under the circumstances. I looked at him, I said, are you mad? I said, you don't want to play against Australia. I said, you you've got to be kidding me. And he just looked at me, he said, great. He said, I'm pleased you said that. He said, I think you'll get 100, and I think you'll get 10 wickets. He was able to get the best out of both them, which other captains, myself included, was never able to do. But as both them arrived at the crease in the second innings, England were 105 for five, having been made to follow on. They still required 122 runs just to make Australia bat again. I think in the history of Test cricket, only one game had been won by the team uh, following on. That was it. In Sydney in 1894-95, England had beaten Australia. We had them. We, we had them on toast. Uh, Beefy had just lost the captaincy. Um, and, uh, you know, the next step for him was another failure or two or three, and he might have been out of the side. Everything was going wrong, and then both of them decided uh, to take on the Australian bowlers. I went out there and I thought, well, I'm not going to go down without asking the question. So why don't we have a bit of fun and see if we can take it back to them, and exactly what we did. There was a man who was completely fired up by the contest, you know, by the personalities on the other side, uh, and a man you would follow. Gradually, England started to believe Graham Dilley was with him at the other end. He scored 56. Both came in and played that just unbelievable innings. He'd be the only player in the world that possibly thought he could do it, and that's the key. It is that those great players think differently. Self-belief was absolutely paramount to the way he performed, and he never gave up, even in uh, you know embarrassing losing causes. Every ball that Beefy hit went for six or went for four, um, or flew over fieldsmen's heads and all this sort of stuff. So it was like a runaway train in the end. By the time both of them had finished, 149, England had something to bowl at. It was a match-changing, series-changing innings, as it turned out. They were 50 for one. We still felt we were in it. Then we got two quick wickets. And then Bob got uh, his tail up and just came steaming in. Graham Dilly took a great catch at fine leg off Rod Marsh. We caught a couple more. And then Gat broke the partnership. And uh, Gat, I think he thought it was a pork pie. As he died full length and took it no problems whatsoever. Uh, and then uh, Bob Willis knocked uh, the stumps all over the place. And it was all over. There was a terrific atmosphere, I and mean, they came on to the pitch at the end, and we made the sprint off. The 81 heading the game is iconic. 
Um, and to see a game change through 180 degrees like that, you, you seldom see that in any class of cricket, let alone in an Ashes Test match. Yeah, these things are what you play professional sport for. England's fight for the Ashes continued at Edgbaston, where Australia were left needing just 151 runs for victory in their second innings. We'd lost a couple of early wickets, then it was Both that got all the wickets on a pretty good deck. It was almost, here we go again. A and, um, you know, we just couldn't get ourselves out of that hole. We should have got the runs in uh, Birmingham. Bateman got five for one. I mean, it was just a magic period of time for him when, you know, everything aligned and everything went well. I think the crowd got me three of those five wickets by just intimidating with the noise. It was quite amazing. So I think the Edgerton crowd and the England supporters, they deserve a pat on the back as well because they certainly got the Aussies going. Just to turn it around in the space of a couple of weeks is just quite extraordinary. And just once he turns things around, he just uh, went berserk. Botham had once again changed the course of a match. Australia fell 30 runs short of their target meaning victory in the fifth test at Old Trafford would see England retain the Ashes. I always say that his innings at Old Trafford, the century there was a far better innings than the one at Headingley. To take on DK Lilly, who is, in my opinion, one of the finest bowlers, if not the finest bowler that's ever lived, um, to take him on and have a day like that against him, and the atmosphere again, it, 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 suddenly the Ashes became very, very, it was almost as important as anything else that was going on in the country. Ian brought the people together and it was literally him who united a nation for a short period of time. And um, people are laughing, but a lot like Bradman, a lot like Farlap. He touched people's core. And what price can you put on that? You've got to give credit to him. And it's just one of those great things that happen in sport, the theatre of sport. I think it just came at exactly the right time. And it certainly cheered me up. Uh, from where I was, and it certainly cheered up the England team, my family. It was just a great time. Um, and one that you look back at it and you think, well, I mean, it is worth it. I still have nightmares about it. I think we play about both of them's ashes, don't we, these days? We didn't quite get the chance to really enjoy that moment, savour it, but believe me, it's, uh, it changed my life. In less than two months, Botham had gone from underachieving captain to international superstar. He was now public property and would find himself on the front pages of the newspapers as much as he did the back. I think the British sports uh, journalists are guilty of building people up and up just so that they can uh, knock them down. Ian was such a one-off and such a brilliant cricketer with bat and ball. Uh, and then he had this um, reputation for high living off the field, he was bound to attract attention. I think the press wanted to write bad things about people that were so famous. And I know they did, I mean, they've experienced some of the story. You were nice to Ian, Ian was nice to you. And then if he felt that the MCC old stuffies were getting on his back, well, he wouldn't like the MCC for a while. Despite having to deal with constant accusations from the press about his private life and disapproving noises from the English cricket board, Botham continued to perform as one of the world's leading all-rounders throughout the mid-80s. Following a two-month ban imposed on him for admitting to using cannabis in 1986, Botham returned to the England side just one wicket behind Dennis Lilly's world record. New Zealand's Bruce Edgar would be the man to face Botham's first ball. Well, it was my first game back after um, a rest. Anyway, I came back and uh, came in, I thought, don't bowl your usual long hop. So I came in, I loosened up a bit more, I gave it everything I had, and the body creaked a little bit, but uh, got it down there, nicked it. Gucci did his utmost to drop it, but hung on to it. And then Jeff Crow followed and bowled a little in-swinger, which he uh, played back to and trapped in front. That was the record. It was almost a joke, wasn't it? People saying, who writes your scripts? But again, that was, I think, partly due to his confidence. You can't, you can't just write that off as him being lucky, because you make your own luck, don't you? However, unbeknownst to both of them, as play continued at the Oval, his friends and club colleagues, Viv Richards and Joel Garner, were unceremoniously sacked by Somerset, 
who had decided to bring in a new overseas player. Upon hearing the news, Botham asked to leave the club. It was um, thoroughly disagreeable to confront. It was, uh, it was all done cloak and dagger. We all knew there was a conspiracy going on. It was a sad period, uh, not the way I wanted to leave Somerset. But I think they called my bluff. I don't think they thought I'd do it. And I made it quite clear. I said, if this is good, I won't be here next year because I can't, I can't tolerate that. I haven't got anything against the individual, but I just felt it was a coup, a coup d'etat, to, um, to change things and to get certain people in place, which I think just helped to change the whole psyche of Somerset. Morph really put his neck on the block when the decision was made. And he stuck with it, you know. We were all very good friends before that, and, and the bond became stronger, you know, after, after his actions. I was only too pleased to go up to Worcester, and I went from very similar grounds and very similar clubs. And we went on to win things at Worcester, and Somerset slowly went down the plug, which um, is a shame, because they, the, the public deserve a lot better than that. They, they, we had a great side there, and uh, it should never have been handled the way it was. Following his record-breaking return against New Zealand, Botham joined up with an unfancied England touring party for the 1986-87 Ashes series in Australia. We were billed as the worst side ever by the Australian press, I hasten to add, and yet ever to, uh, to make it out to Australia, where the first month of the tour was so appallingly bad. We had our own journalist, a guy called Martin Johnson, who said, there are only three things this side cannot do. They cannot bat, they cannot bowl, they cannot field. So that was how he went into the series. One Englishman was set to prove the critics wrong. Botham hit 138 in the first test to rekindle memories of 1981 and set England on their way to another Ashes victory. It would be his final test century. The game was probably in the balance uh, early in the first innings and um, Beefy comes in and belts a, a big hundred in, in very quick time. And the whole momentum of the game changes and uh, yeah, it was, it's quite, Phenomenal how often he did that against uh, Australian cricket teams. Ian Botham, 38, down the deck, Matthews, whack, on my knees, hits me in the <laughs> I cost us the ashes. I catch that catch, my world is a different environment. But I, I dropped him. It was buzzing. England were beating Australia. Everything was wrapped up and done and dusted by uh, the Melbourne Test. And we didn't lose an international game, I don't think, all the way through that series. He led massively off the field, I heard. Massively. This is how it's going to go, fellas. We're going to do bang, bang, bang. And everyone just got up for him. Botham's international career would continue intermittently until 1992, by which stage his exploits had taken their toll on his body. But by the time of his final test match against Pakistan, he'd scored 14 test hundreds and taken 383 wickets. I was a shadow of my former self. I couldn't bowl at any real pace. Just basically waddled in and lived off um, a bit of experience and nowhere near the power I was. And that's really why retirement came not much longer afterwards. You know, if you can't do it at that level and you, and you can't perform as you want to, then I think it's a good time to move on. And it's better to let someone else come through. His impact was enormous. I'm never going to be able to re you know, this, this, this man was was very special. If you were picking a, a world 11 of cricketers throughout the ages, Ian Botham would definitely be in there. It was just his time. A truly world-class all-rounder. When you look at Imran Khan and Kapil Dev and Sir Richard Hadley, great all-rounders, but there was only one Ian Botham. He had a flair which was a natural gift. You couldn't ask for anyone better. Absolutely invincible, either as a catcher, as a bowler, I'll get this block out with an orange, or with a bat, I'm going to hit this into the stand every ball. He couldn't be beat, and that was one of the most extraordinary things about him. I've seen too many players hanging on into their late 30s, early 40s because they, have, they don't want to let go and they can't let go. Well, I didn't have to let go. I just walked from one box 
to another box. I went from the changing room to the commentary box, and I've had a great time, and I love it.